We are really pleased today to be welcoming back an old friend of the Fort Hall Forum, Leonard Peikoff. I'm very pleased to introduce now a board member, a longtime board member of the Fort Hall Forum, Jeffrey Smith, who will introduce Dr. Peikoff. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Once again, the Ford Hall Forum is pleased to welcome Dr. Leonard Peikoff to the campus of Northeastern University. Ayn Rand's close associate for 30 years, Dr. Peikoff is recognized as the foremost interpreter of her philosophy of reason, egoism, and laissez-faire capitalism. From 1957 until 1973, Dr. Peikoff taught philosophy at Hunter College, Long Island University, New York University, the University of Denver, and the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. After that, he worked full-time on the ominous parallels and gave lectures across the country. He has taught courses on Ayn Rand's philosophy regularly in New York City, which were taped and played to groups in some hundred cities in the United States, Canada, and Europe, and they are now available for sale. Dr. Peikoff is the author of Objectivism, The Philosophy of Ayn Rand, the definitive statement of objectivism. He has been a contributor to Barron's, an associate editor with Ayn Rand of The Objectivist and The Ayn Rand Letter. Like several other bright young men who were part of the Rand inner circle, among them Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Dr. Peikoff was attracted to objectivism because of its view of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. This afternoon, he brings that perspective to an exploration of the unlikely tension between a democratic nation and its people in a talk entitled, America versus Americans. Dr. Peikoff says that from its beginnings, America has stood for the ideals of the Enlightenment, reason, individual rights, capitalism, and the pursuit of happiness. Dr. Peikoff argues, however, that the dominant trend in America today, trends endorsed not only by our leadership, but seemingly by the public at large, represent the opposite of these ideals. Let's hear more. I give you Dr. Leonard Peikoff. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I chose the topic for my lecture today many months ago, long before the war against Iraq. Now, however, given my announced subject, I'm in the unenviable position of criticizing our Iraq policy in the very midst of the fighting. So before my criticism, let me tell you up front what I do agree with in this regard. Iraq, as ruled by Saddam Hussein, is, or was, a brutal dictatorship and an enemy who had to be stopped. Hussein was ominously armed, and the country did have some actual ties to the terrorists. I also agree that it is very much better to wage war on Iraq than to sit on our hands and do nothing. So, of course, I'm 100% behind our soldiers, and it's obvious that we will prevail and defeat this enemy of ours. But none of this changes the fact that I am a philosopher, not a journalist or a politician, and that it is my job to identify the basic principles governing our citizens and our foreign policy, the principles and their long-range results on America. And from that perspective, as I will explain in due course, I have many criticisms of our war in Iraq. Now, that's a prefatory comment to my lecture. Now, I would like you, please, to put Iraq aside for half an hour, because I want to stand back and gain some perspective on current events 
and on the public reaction to them. I want to look at the whole picture of America versus the terrorists in the last 19 months. And I want to start back in the 18th century with about 60 seconds on the founding of America, the greatest country in history. Our founding fathers, champions of the Enlightenment and of individual rights, were not only outraged at the abuses of a tyrant, they knew they were absolutely right to be outraged. So they had the immense self-confidence, the moral certainty, and the physical courage necessary to declare war against the most powerful empire in the world. The Americans of that era were innocent and benevolent. They were uplifted by the prospect of breaking with the corruption of the past and starting a rational country for the first time in history. And they knew what had always been the top enemy of their new rational world. I quote Elihu Palmer, who said, quote, it has hitherto been deemed a crime to think, but at last men have escaped from the long and doleful night of religion, with its frenzy, its fanaticism, its mad enthusiasm, unquote. On 9-11, the long and doleful night once more entered the scene of Western history. The frenzy, fanaticism, and mad enthusiasm finally went to war against America with the declared purpose of wiping out everything our country stands for. <clears throat> On some level, President Bush seemed to understand the uniqueness of 9-11. He has compared it validly to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. But 9-11, he has suggested, is worse. And even in purely quantitative terms, he is right about that. 9-11 killed hundreds more people, wounded double the number of Pearl Harbor, and caused massively greater destruction. $40.2 billion worth, not counting all the economic losses and bankruptcies it has caused since that date. Now, there is no powerful British Empire for the U.S. to fear today. There is no military capability anywhere on the globe that would dare to challenge the United States, which is recognized everywhere as the world's only superpower who can squelch any nation or coalition we choose to target. So what has our answer been to 9-11? I want to review some key points in chronological order. Not just of our government's policies against terrorism, but above all, of the American public's response to them. And the com comparable policies and response in World War II which was fought just 60 years ago by our grandfathers. <clears throat> My real purpose in discussing foreign policy here is to form a hypothesis about our countrymen as a whole today. Who is the American public now, and what do they think about world and moral issues? Are the men walking the streets and answering the opinion polls since 9-11 the posterity of the Founding Fathers? Is this what is left of the noblest experiment in history? On the day of Pearl Harbor, Americans were stunned and enraged. <clears throat> On December 8, 41, the next day, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of whom I am no admirer, gave his short, famous day of infamy speech promising absolute victory over the Japanese. At first, when 9-11 occurred, the country reacted in similar terms, disbelief and rage. <clears throat> there was grief for the victims, admiration for the heroic police and firemen, but above all, there was the desire for self-defense, retaliation, revenge. <clears throat> There was a surge of patriotism. American flags appeared everywhere. The national atmosphere was solemn, tense, funereal. Hollywood canceled programs that seemed insensitive. The left was scared stiff and kept silent. There was no more business as usual. 
The country was gearing up psychologically for a battle of life and death. On September 20th, in the midst of the national fury, President Bush gave his famous speech to Congress. Like Roosevelt, he sought to rally and inspire the country. He too pledged a militant response in the destruction of our enemies. The biggest difference between the speeches, however, is what FDR did not say that Bush, by contrast, insisted upon. <clears throat> Bush's speech is worthy of attention. It foretokens the whole response to terrorism of patriotic Americans ever since. <clears throat> Along with his vows of retaliation, Bush's speech is brimming over with appeasement of the very nations and institutions that created or feed the terrorist axis. Our president, not to put too fine a point on it, sucked up to virtually every enemy in sight. He told us about his gratitude for prayers to us in Arabic, about the, quote, sympathy offered at a mosque in Cairo, about the Pakistanis and Iranians killed in the explosion, about, quote, our many Muslim friends. He boasted that we not only respect Afghanistan, but are currently its largest source of humanitarian aid. He offered his gratitude for support from the Islamic world. The terrorists, he stressed, <clears throat> are, quote, a fringe form of Islamic extremism that perverts the peaceful teaching of Islam. We respect your faith. Its teachings are good, unquote. <clears throat> now, Bush, being deeply religious himself, did not even hint at the truth that religiosity is the indispensable background and driving force of 9-11. Everyone knows the role in the anti-American jihad of Islamic faith, from the mosques and seminaries in Iran and Saudi Arabia, all the way to the crazed suicide bombers hurrying to meet their 72 perpetual virgins in paradise. Now, I do not need to demonize Islam. The Islamic world enjoyed a high civilization during the very Middle Ages when Christianity was making the West just about as barbaric as the Middle East is today. <clears throat> the issue is not Islam versus Christianity. Every religion by its nature, by its rejection of reason, is compelled to turn to force and violence ultimately. Every religion is a threat to civilization as soon as it can get its hands on political power. Just as Christianity was a threat and a malignant force for 1,000 years after Rome fell. So let us grant in principle that Islam is no worse than Christianity and that there is a large moderate wing within Islam that is not the initiator of the jihads against us. My point is that it is irrelevant, any of this, to a discussion of 9-11 because even so, Islam is still the enemy. In every war of aggression, there are within the territory of the aggressors a large group of moderates. These are the vast horde of Peter Keatings who initiate nothing but merely watch silently or follow the latest trend. These types would never start any kind of crusade on their own. It is only a small militant minority with access to political power or colluding governments. It is only the activists at the top that initiate atrocities. And this was just as true in Japan in the 40s as in Islam today. In both cases, vast groups of men were innocent of any plans for aggression and wanted to live in peace with the United States. But once the activist leadership has acted, the moderates no longer count in history. They either go along passively, becoming mere ciphers of history, or they come to endorse emotionally what they see their leadership doing. This kind of capitulation is what happened to the people of Japan, and this is what is happening in the Arab street today where since 9-11 we have seen massive Muslim hatred of America, even among crowds who are not Islamic fundamentalists. 
Now, if there were a vocal Islamic movement attacking the fundamentalist jihad and championing America's self-defense, that would make a big difference here. But to my knowledge, there is no such movement, neither here nor abroad. In a speech declaring war against a vicious enemy, it is a moral crime to distinguish between the active instigators and their passive legions. What you must denounce in such a speech, if you are a proper patriotic leader, is the essence of the threat. Philosophically, on the deepest level, what Bush should have said was some equivalent of the prayer which Maureen Dowd, herself, by the way, a religious woman, saw scrawled on a wall in Washington soon after 9-11. Dear God, save us from the people who believe in you. <laughs> Of course, we could hardly expect Bush to say or even think such a thing. But he could at least have said that the enemy was a major and widely popular wing within Islam. Instead, he brazenly pretended that apart from a handful of lunatics, the whole world of Islam was our friend. <clears throat> what would the country have thought of FDR if in his December 8th speech he had expressed gratitude for prayers in Japanese? adulated, quote, our many Japanese friends, denounced the bombers as perverters of Shintoism, and classified the attackers as a fringe form of fascism. Do you think Americans would have stood for this in 1941? Or would they have cried out in protest because of the shame to them of displaying such national weakness and cowardice? But what was our country's response to Bush's speech? It went wild with praise. Commentators across the spectrum, speaking in an atmosphere of national adulation for Bush, thank God for having a true leader in such perilous times. In the polls of October 2001, primarily on the basis of this one speech, almost 80% of the country approved of the way Bush was handling foreign affairs, which is an extraordinarily high figure. The American rage over 9-11 lasted about three weeks. As against the angry militant resolve during the long years of World War II. Even as America was going to war in Afghanistan, such as it did, there was a gradual but easy transition in the nation back to psychological business as usual. The cautious shows were quickly, uh, the canceled shows were cautiously uh, reinstated. The left was noisy. It was normal life again. <clears throat> the public seemed to think it had done its part since it had plastered the flag everywhere. The enemy, after all, Bush had said, is not a major world force, but a mere lunatic fringe. And Bush had demanded patience and told us to expect a long war, which had overtones of Vietnam, and who can live with a permanent emergency. And most important and most gruesome, it had been a month, two months, six months since the bombing. So it was starting to feel to a great many people, that's mere history. <clears throat> the cries for vengeance died down. The president was in charge, people said, who am I to make foreign policy? The emotional focus at home, <clears throat> nurtured by a relentless journalistic campaign, changed from rage to grief and praise. Grief for the victims who were methodically eulogized and praise for the domestic heroes of 9-11. Now, of course, it's proper to grieve for the victims and admire the courageous heroes who tried to rescue them. But if your country is at war with a mortal enemy, these issues should not be the major focus of your emotion. Your whole passion must be on destroying the enemy. If what dominates you is grief rather than anger, the victims, not their killers. The tragic past, not a smashing victory in the future. <clears throat> that is a sure sign of people starting to withdraw emotionally from the world and give up the battle internally. The same psychology continues to this day. Witness the battle over whether ground zero is sacred and the indignant anger against the idea that it should become the site of new life 
of new American self-assertion in the form of gigantic new skyscrapers. Instead, we are told the land should become a barren tombstone, a symbol of a nation nursing its wounds, more concerned with remembering pain than pursuing happiness or self-defense. The topic of self-defense brings me to the war in Afghanistan. Its essence is contained in the fact that before it even started, the government changed its name. The first code name for this military operation was Infinite Justice. This name was dropped to avoid, believe it or not, to avoid offending Muslims who are objecting to the name on the ground that only God can mete out infinite justice. I understand, Mr. Rumsfeld, the leading hawk replied. America went into Afghanistan filled with ambivalence, uncertainty, and even guilt. Our leadership was afraid of Afghan civilian casualties, afraid of American casualties, and afraid in general of being hated in the Mideast as infidel imperialists. So they settled on a pitiful proxy war in which we were not combatants, but merely advisors. What we advised was warring tribes open to bribery from all sides, catching prisoners and then letting them escape often en masse as in the worst incident of that war, Tora Bora, while the U.S. looked on helplessly wringing its hands. <clears throat> the Americans sent not many soldiers to that war, but a great many incredibly expensive bombs and missiles, which achieved numerous and mostly useless holes in the ground. <clears throat> they did not dare bomb population centers, uh, where Al-Qaeda and the Taliban promptly hid out, thereby eluding capture. And along with the bombs, needless to say, we covered the country with care packages. Was this a war or a pretense and a charade? A war in self-defense must be fought without self-crippling restrictions placed on our commanders. And it must secure victory as quickly as possible, regardless of how many innocent civilians are caught in the line of fire, or are deliberate targets of that fire. These innocents suffer and die because of the action of their own government in sponsoring the initiation of force against us. Their fate, therefore, is their government's moral responsibility, not ours. If you want to know what a real war would be, I'm going to quote a brief excerpt from a book entitled the Soul of Battle by Victor Davis Hanson. On one day in March 1945, <clears throat> an extreme day granted, but still only one day, and I quote, 334 B-29s left their Marianas bases for Tokyo. 500-pound incendiary clusters fell over Tokyo every 50 feet. Within 30 minutes, a 28-mile-per-hour ground wind sent the flames roaring out of control. Temperatures approached 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The general in command, Curtis LeMay, wished to destroy completely the material and psychological capital of the Japanese people on the brutal theory that once civilians had tasted what their soldiers had done to others, only then might their murderous armies crack. Over 80,000 Japanese died outright that day. 40,918 were injured. Over 267,000 buildings were destroyed and one million Japanese were left homeless, unquote. That is how we fought World War II and how we deterred future attacks on the U.S. and how we defeated fascism. Now, how do you think the American public would have reacted in the 40s if the war against Japan had been conducted like the war in Afghanistan, or in Iraq for that matter? I was only a child at the time, <clears throat> but my guess is that there would have been riots in the streets and FDR would have been impeached. What the war in Afghanistan did is send a message to the world that we are a self-made paper tiger to scare no one. In practical terms, all the war really accomplished was to scatter the enemy, including most of its leadership to other countries, mainly Pakistan, leaving the threat to the U.S. from Al-Qaeda as bad as ever. 
That war was not only a colossal defeat for the world's only superpower, it was a joke. Now, what was the American public's response to this debacle? We won the war, the president and the press said brazenly, and people en masse bought it. They were still passionately for Bush. There was no challenge to his leadership except from the far left. But from the Republicans in Congress and from the Democrats too, we heard only that Bush had conducted exactly the right kind of war and how marvelously he led us. There was a virtual hysteria of patriotism surrounding Bush at that point. Patriotism, patriotism seemed to be defined as rally round the leader blindly, seemingly no matter what he does. In effect, to challenge Bush's foreign policy in any way is un-American and almost treasonable. But despite all their excitement, people seemed to realize on some level that the war had solved nothing. Our leaders kept stressing that the problem of terrorism was nationwide, virtually intractable, here to stay for a long, long time. So people felt helpless and afraid. 66% of Americans said that they looked to the future without hope, that they believed life would not be better for their children than it was for them. You could see it gradually happening all around you. People were slowly giving up on the attempt to eradicate terrorism. They were learning to resign themselves to it, to adjust to it, and accept it as a normal part of life which is here to stay. What lesson did you learn from 9-11? People were asked continually by the press. I read the answer dozens of times. I learned to hug my children. I learned not to take my family for granted. I learned that life is ephemeral and we must enjoy the moment because who knows how long we have. <clears throat> At the time of Pearl Harbor, no such sentiments were voiced. The attitude then was not, it is American lives that are ephemeral, but the lives of the Japanese. And we are going to make damn sure that they are ephemeral, that they're over as fast as possible. A university professor at Columbia University, writing in the New York Times, was elated by the new American sense of helplessness and hopelessness, which he gleefully picked up on. He titled his article, quote, a whiff of dread for the land of hope, unquote. Now this new dread was metaphysical, not practical. It was the fear and helplessness that people experience, no matter how rich and militarily strong they are, when they renounce the possibility of acting to end a threat and ex instead accept evil as the normal. So the fact that America is the only superpower has virtually no effect on people. They remain afraid of the rest of the world, even without any practical reason for it. <clears throat> Regarding the war on Iraq, for example, a retired nurse, speaking for a large segment of Americans, said before it started that she was afraid, quote, that the rest of the world might turn on us if Mr. Bush failed to pursue his goals with patience, unquote. The emotional state of permanent dread is unbearable. So a great many people here simply wanted the crisis to end somehow. Many started talking about healing and closure, despite the facts. And many took to stating that, after all, there are other concerns beside terrorism to worry about, such as the economy. Confronted by the possibility of the ultimate downfall of Western civilization, Americans in a poll last January quote, said they were twice as concerned about the economy as they were about either a pending war in Iraq or the war on terrorism, unquote. <clears throat> that indicates just how short-range our country has become. Afghanistan was wrong war number one in the fight against terrorism. <clears throat> Obviously, it's proper to retaliate right away against the specific thugs who perpetrated 9-11. But terrorism is an ideological phenomenon. The ideology of Islamic fundamentalism, the ideology of burning religious hatred of secular Western values. And you cannot stop or even wound such a lethal ideology 
merely by chasing after some of its thugs in their hiding places. <clears throat> to defeat Nazism in World War II, nothing less than a massive assault on its home base, Germany, on the country at the heart of Nazism's support and export was necessary. And the same principle applies to Islamic fundamentalism. The Germany of Islamic fundamentalism is not Afghanistan or Iraq, it is Iran, as I will discuss shortly. <clears throat> now let's jump to November 2002, when the Republicans surprised the country by winning both houses of Congress. They won apparently because people, despite everything they had seen, still regarded Bush as a strong leader. A poll taken during the midterms showed Republicans beating Democrats by 30 points on the question, quote, which party is tough enough on terrorism, unquote. <clears throat> the Democrats are not tough enough, of course, but the Republicans are, give me a break. <clears throat> Now, the pro-Bush attitude extended not merely to conservatives, but apparently to the last real hope of this country. I mean the men on the street, <clears throat> not the elite with their corrupting college education, but the workers, unpolluted by attendance at the Ivy League. After the elections, a blue-collar New Hampshire man who unloads delivery trucks at Home Depot said of Bush, quote, I like his hard nose, unquote. As they say in law, raise ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. Now, of course, you can say the people are at the mercy of the intellectuals who bear the fundamental blame here. True. But the intellectuals are not all powerful. And beyond a certain point, the people, especially in this country, which still has the best people on earth, the people are responsible, regardless of what they have been taught. <clears throat> Even non-intellectuals still have their powers as human beings. The power of observation, of thought, and of righteous indignation. If they do not exercise their powers, they cannot be excused, romanticized, or whitewashed. They must be judged morally for their passivity. <clears throat> Now, this brings me to the present wrong war number two, in my opinion, Iraq. <clears throat> the first thing wrong with this war, I believe, was the six-month-long spectacle which preceded it. The spectacle of the United States on its knees morally, groveling, practically begging enemies, neutrals, friends, everybody <clears throat> in the UN and NATO to approve it. If Bush's argument is correct, and Iraq was a mortal threat to the survival of our country, how could we have given up the moral prerogative to take immediate unilateral action against it? How can we allow months to go by because of the whims of France? President Bush finally gave up on the UN and came out for unilateral American action while stressing that it wasn't really unilateral since we had a large coalition with us. But he and Powell hastened to make clear the vital importance, so they said, of UN approval and its significant involvement in Iraq after the war. The implication seems to be that we are not a sovereign state any longer, with the right and the autonomy to defend ourselves, but only a fragment of a world body, over half of which hates us passionately. Nobody dreamed of wheeling and dealing with any international committee in regard to whether it was all right to respond at once to Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Yet Mr. Bush's popularity was still strong this year despite everything that the country had seen. As of January, 59% of Americans approved of the way Bush is performing his job. <clears throat> In the same poll, believe it or not, 52% of the public said they believed, quote, the government has done all it can be reasonably expected to do to protect the country from future terrorist attacks, unquote. So on Iraq too, it is and remains follow the leader. And mind you, this is true even though the majority understands that there are grave flaws in our foreign policy. 
In January, for example, 55% of Americans, quote, said the administration was reacting to events as they occurred abroad rather than having a clear foreign policy plan, unquote. And yet, despite this, people remain largely happy with the president and his so-called hard nose. <clears throat> the country has followed Bush all the way. Observing his deference to the UN, they mimicked it even when he personally was growing impatient. In February, an astounding 59% of Americans said they believed the president should give the UN more time. 63% said that Washington should not act without the support of its allies. And in March, last month, nearly two-thirds of the country said that Mr. Bush should take into account the views of anti-war protesters before he acted. And if you need to know even more about the public mind on this issue, People were asked in February about their, war t their attitude toward the Iraqi war if substantial Iraqi casualties were involved. <clears throat> when faced with this question, the 66% pro-war majority collapsed. The country was evenly split, 46% in favor of war, 45% against. In other words, a huge number of Americans do not want a war with casualties. <clears throat> An almost identical change from pro-war to even split occurred when people were asked about a war with Iraq if there were substantial American casualties. <clears throat> so on the one hand, Americans claim to believe by a sizable majority, something like two-thirds of the country, that the war in Iraq is an issue of national survival against an enemy who can help to annihilate us with unbelievably horrible weapons. Yet on the other hand, we are not to be in any particular hurry about doing something, and certainly there must be no substantial casualties on either side. <clears throat> the public was and still is following the leader obediently. Two leaders in this case. The state says war, and Bush's leader, the church, says no casualties. So the American pragmatist on the street says, okay, I accept all of it, everything, whatever I'm told. Who am I to decide on morality or foreign policy? <clears throat> now I'll look at the war itself, and first our choice of country to attack at this point in history. <clears throat> uh, I've already, now I'm running late, but you started late, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> I've already told you on what counts I agree with Bush in regard to Iraq. But the obvious question on all these very same counts is why Iraq and not Iran? Iran, as everyone in Washington knows, is the birthplace, 1979, and the center of the modern Muslim fundamentalist movement. That is why Iran has much greater ties with all the terrorist groups than the secular Iraqi regime ever did and why Iran is incomparably more active in turning out, supporting, arming, and exporting terrorists. <clears throat> Iran, too, is a brutal dictatorship, and it, too, is working feverishly, and even more effectively in some respects than Iraq, to stockpile nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. Even Bush himself included Iran in his axis of evil, along with Iraq and North Korea. <clears throat> But he does nothing to single out Iran as by far our gravest enemy, gravest in the context of the terrorist crisis. Iran is the only religious nation of those three, and Bush does not want to name this fact, i.e. to have to reveal the ideological reason why Iran is our supreme enemy, because his whole worldview is tied to the virtue and alleged peacefulness of religion as such of any variety. <clears throat> By the way, if we are short of any countries to target militarily, what about such obviously eligible places as Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Syria, all incomparably greater strongholds of terrorism than Iraq? <clears throat> Bush evades all of this. He even regards Saudi Arabia and Pakistan as allies. <clears throat> as to Iran, he tells us we need not take any action because we can now count on its civilian student unrest, its internal ferment, and possible change on its own. Now, in fact, its pro-Western unrest and ferment, which are real, 
makes it obviously the logical place for us to begin. <clears throat> now let me add here that if we did take on Iran or Saudi Arabia <clears throat> and did so seriously, using all of our powers, overthrowing its corrupt government, wiping out its terrorists, armaments, and anti-American agitators, whether inside mosques or outside them, then Iraq and probably North Korea too would be no further threat to us, <clears throat> even if left alone with no war declared against him. A thug like Saddam Hussein would have run for cover if he had believed that the U.S. really meant business. A war against Iraq, however, <clears throat> is the easiest war for Bush to have picked for many reasons. Among them is the fact that many Republicans are eager <coughs> to erase the black mark of Bush Sr.'s disgraceful flight from Iraq in 1991. They want to finally finish that war properly. <coughs> but the major reason the choice of Iraq is easy for Mr. Bush is that Iraq under Saddam Hussein is a secular, non-religious country it is not a bastion of Islam or a fundamentalist hatred. <clears throat> so you can declare war on it without really mortally offending or challenging any religious movement, including Islam. In other words, precisely because Iraq is not a source of significant support of the ideology at the root of 9-11, the Republicans feel morally allowed to wage war against it. <clears throat> A war picked in part because its government is not Islamic will do very little to deter Islamic terrorist countries. <laughs> it seems obvious <clears throat> that our administration is giving such countries a free pass. <clears throat> I read today about a few tiny hints from unidentified administration hawks that Iran's turn might yet be coming. If so, Bush could still save the world, and I'll throw out this whole speech. <laughs> but unfortunately, so far, this scenario is still only a fantasy. Now, to make things worse, <clears throat> our leaders hasten to add that our motives in this war are not only or even primarily our own self-defense, they are also strongly altruistic. The ward's code name is Operation Iraqi Freedom. We are not out only to save the world from Saddam, but even more important, we will shower the lovable Iraqis with everything good. Food, medicine, supplies, individual rights, freedom, a whole new reconstruction, you name it. And that is what makes self-defense okay as against being mere selfishness on our part. The conduct of the war so far largely follows from its stated moral purpose. Now, I'm not talking about the great courage and heroism of our troops, which are real, nor am I talking about their size, about which I have no opinion. <clears throat> I'm talking about the battle orders. The troops have been instructed methodically to pull their punches, in other words, to spare Iraq's civilians and its infrastructures and even more, and I quote, to avoid the kind of fighting that might enrage the Iraqi people, unquote. <clears throat> In pursuing this policy, hundreds of critical high-priority Iraqi targets have been removed from the attack plan. There are to be no massive bombs or missile attacks directly on urban centers, such as Basra or Baghdad, even though such attacks, if extensive and powerful enough, would have ended the war much more quickly and decisively. Instead, we were given the spectacle of our troops crawling through blinding sandstorms to Baghdad, subject to continual ambush. In fact, to show you how our troops have been hobbled, <coughs> Each military unit in Iraq has had a lawyer attached to it. His function is to vet any decision to target the enemy when there's any risk of civilian casualties. For example, if a mortar launcher is next to a school, the soldiers need first to get permission from a lawyer before they can take out the launcher. 
even if such delay involves some risk to their own lives. If they don't get the permission, they are told they can be prosecuted for war crimes should any Iraqi civilian be hurt. While we have been undermining our own ability to fight, it's only our massive military power that can win in spite of these tactics. <clears throat> While we have been undermining our own ability to fight, Iraq's gleeful policy and response <clears throat> is to deploy civilian shields everywhere, including in schools and hospitals, to put soldiers in civilian clothes, to park fighter jets in cemeteries, to dress an army officer in civilian clothes and force him to drive out in a taxi as a suicide bomber, to launch attacks from supposedly holy to them mosques, to use ambulances to carry troops dressed in white coats who suddenly start shooting at Americans, all of it delaying and subverting the U.S. effort. One U.S. commander stated the situation as follows, and get this, quote, <clears throat> this war is asymmetrical warfare. Asymmetrical warfare. The Iraqis are blasting away knowing that for moral reasons the Americans can't. Unquote. <clears throat> Our policy, in other words, is known to be emboldening the enemy, prolonging battles, and endangering American troops. As one small early example, a quote from a New York Times summary. Gunfire came from a house, then Iraqi soldiers began to run, and Captain Josh Evans helped direct helicopters toward the men. But just as the gunship was preparing to strike, he said, Americans glimpsed civilians running just behind the soldiers. The gunship was waved away at the last second. We had to let the terrorists go, Captain Evans said. Unquote. <clears throat> The number of our casualties has been small so far, but it is growing every day. And many of our injuries and deaths were utterly unnecessary, the result of our own policies. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Pentagon has been struggling with an obscene question. How many needless American deaths should it allow? Or, as the New York Times writer puts it, quote, the military must struggle with the deadly calculus of how many casualties it is willing to incur among its own forces to save civilian lives." Unquote. <clears throat> now, they seem to have decided to allow a lot of casualties. A senior officer at the Central Command said recently that the U.S. was prepared to pay, quote, a very high price in men. In uh, unquote, in desperately struggling American soldiers to topple Hussein. And here's a quote from this senior officer. If that means there will be a lot of casualties, then that means there will be a lot of casualties. Unquote. Even one American life deliberately imperiled by this kind of policy, for this kind of reason, is a moral atrocity. It is literally turning our men into sacrificial offerings. But Mr. Bush has no problem with this, apparently. Americans, he said approvingly, know how to, quote, sacrifice for the liberty of strangers, unquote. <clears throat> now, will this kind of circumspect, self-sacrificing war help to deter other terrorist countries in the future? The way the war is being fought allows the Arab world to be enraged, but it does not terrorize them. <clears throat> and it is thereby encouraging the Arab calls for jihad and for more terrorism. <clears throat> A retired general who served in the first Gulf War predicted that the difficult first two weeks of the war, he said that we would prevail, obviously, but he thought those first two weeks would harm the nation standing as a military force. And here's a quote from him. <clears throat> What's troublesome is the loss of deterrent value. A month ago, everybody in the world looked at the U.S. military as being 10 feet tall. We're not 10 feet tall, unquote. Now, despite all this, as of March 30, and I'm sure to this day, <clears throat> 
Nearly three out of four Americans remained unshaken in their support of Bush's war policies, unquote. A typical case in point is a lady from Spokane, Washington, an account manager for a financial company who declared yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, last Wednesday, that she has trusted President Bush to do the right thing ever since 9-11. And as to the war in Iraq, quote, it has got to be done and I will support whatever President Bush does, unquote. <clears throat> now that is all I have to say today about the war in Iraq. It seems to me too early and therefore unfair <clears throat> to analyze or comment on the battle for Baghdad, which is still underway as I speak. I can only say that so far, it doesn't seem that the policies of the first weeks of the war are going to be scrapped or essentially changed. Now let us ask for the source of what I can only describe as our passive, gutless public. <clears throat> what causes this amoral, follow-the-leader mentality? Content to fight in out-of-context spurts while resigning itself to terrorism long run. My answer in a word is brainwashing, <clears throat> not political, but educational. Brain brainwashing carried out for decades by the school system. The method is simple. You undercut the ability of the young, generation after generation, to think independently while at the same time you insinuate into their minds all the doctrines that will destroy basic values, kill initiative in political affairs, and paralyze people's capacity for action. You end up with a nation of sheep. <clears throat> now I repeat what I said. A man bears some of the responsibility if he succumbs to this brainwashing. And the proof is that many Americans have not yet succumbed to it. But tragically, the majority, I believe, have succumbed. The single greatest destroyer in this context has been progressive education, which in various forms still dominates the U.S. from kindergarten through graduate school. Young intelligences who desperately need guidance if they are to develop their intellectual capacities are taught routinely that there are no objective facts, no principles, no absolutes, no certainty, and no philosophy to give them long-range direction. They are taught that there is no alternative, therefore, but to act as pragmatists, to treat any problem short-range, on its own terms, out of context, and to cope with it by doing whatever seems to work for now, given the social or world consensus of the moment. And as to tomorrow, who can know? They are taught all this over and over again virtually everywhere. Now, what can possibly result from such training? <clears throat> training in disregarding reality, abandoning thought and adapting to the group. What can result but the atrophy of individual self-confidence and of intellectual activity? And to the extent that a person then sees himself as a helpless being caught in an unknowable flux, how can he act except by the guidance of an authority, political or otherwise? An authority which will lift the impossible responsibility of decision and action from his shoulders and tell him in any confusing situation what must be done. <clears throat> but the catch here is that our own leadership by this time has had the very same education. So it is the pragmatist leading the pragmatist. Washington and with it the country <clears throat> are immersed in the flow of momentary concretes, staring at single trees with no interest in or even idea of a forest. At one moment, the government thinks we must capture Osama above all. At the next, the president tells us coolly that one man is not important. <clears throat> the public response, okay, maybe it's a change, but there are no absolutes. At one moment, we hear Al-Qaeda is the enemy we, we must go after and root out. At the next, a single one of its arms suppliers out of dozens is the real enemy to smash. In any way, what about the oppressed Iraqis? The public response, <clears throat> okay, if that's today's crisis, but let's not antagonize the world consensus. At one moment in some month, the market is down or unemployment is up, so the economy seems to the public to be the most important issue. <clears throat> Who can know the long-range future of the world anyway, they think? 
What I do know is that right now I'm out of a job. <clears throat> now the other part of the brainwashing. As you are creating a mental void in the nation, you simultaneously fill it with moral corruption of a kind which will mute or stifle self-assertion on the part of the citizenry. And in this connection, the altruism of Bush's policies, long prepared in the schools and churches, is crucial. Whatever the government does, if it throws billions away on a humanitarian largesse to the enemy, or creates nightmare chaos at the airports, <clears throat> or piles up casualties in the wrong country in the name of liberating the oppressed, people tend to accept, they don't complain too much, because they know it's their duty not to be selfish, but to serve others and sacrifice. Part of altruism, of course, is forgiveness and mercy, which God commands. And he, of course, for the conservative and patriotic wing of the country, is the biggest authority of all. <clears throat> so we must now not merely preach piety, as in the old World War II days, but actually obey the Lord in action. We must fight New Testament wars, with battle plans taken from the Ser Sermon on the Mount, following principles defined 2,000 years ago by a sect that was waiting for the world to come to an end and couldn't care less what happened in this life. <clears throat> Do you see how much more Christian, how much more faith-directed, how much less reason-directed our public has become in just 60 years? Now, besides the helplessly obedient skeptic, and the obediently helpless Christian, <clears throat> there are many more corrupt and paralyzing ideas circulating in our country. As just one more example, think of multiculturalism, which is an assault on our national self-esteem and initiative of unprecedented proportions. Are we any better, many educated Americans today ask, than the cultures that hate us? Don't they have a right to their ideas and values too? Do you see how we can be the world's only superpower and nevertheless be unable to fight our enemies? Fearsome weaponry is of no value if the man with his finger on the button cannot bring himself or his countrymen to make the decision to push it. <clears throat> At the start of this country, men who had been brought up to think independently and to act long range according to the principle of pursuing their own happiness these men could unite and go to war in a passionate cause. Just think of it. These men fought a righteous, bloody rebellion against such relatively small evils as attacks on tea and on stamps. <clears throat> While their posterity today, not all but a frightening number of them, facing cataclysmic threats, sits befuddled and becalmed, making only sporadic forays here and there without context or overall plan. That is what I mean by the title of my talk, America versus Americans. In other words, versus a great number of today's Americans. <clears throat> Today we need something even more important than the right war. We need the route that will make it possible for us to do whatever is necessary in our own self-defense and to do it righteously without any moral qualms about it. <clears throat> in other words, we need an ideological war against all of the doctrines that are confusing and paralyzing this nation. Now, if I can see it. From today's New York Times, it's too small for me to read, someone from the Middle East, a specialist uh, on the Middle East said, quote, the Arabs understand that this war is happening at two levels, on the ground in Iraq and an, also an ideological war once the uh, ground war is over. They know that they're go how the first one is going to turn out and they are debating how to wage the second. They know the real issue. Do we? <clears throat> well, we at the Ayn Rand Institute are doing what we can to spread some better ideas. <clears throat> Dr. Jerome Brook alone, its executive director, sitting right there, in the last six months, has been interviewed on 59 radio and television programs and in the press, and has given 31 speeches to groups large and small, trying to get the word out. 
But no one man, even he, no one institute can change the world. Some people say that the next terrorist atrocity on American soil will make a difference and finally arouse the public. I hope so. But I fear that without the right philosophic ideas, the next atrocity too, however monstrous, will probably in the long run change very little in our policies. The tragedy is that America is helplessly vulnerable when it would be so easy for it to become triumphantly secure. There is still time to change our direction, but not a lot of time. History is not infinitely elastic. <clears throat> so I appeal to you in conclusion, if you can contribute anything to a revolution of ideas in this country, a revolution that will oust the establishment ideology and recreate a rational public, now is the time to become a philosophic hero and to do it on whatever scale is open to you. If you can make enough of your countrymen start to think, America can still be saved. Thank you. Thank you. As is the case at every Ford Hall Forum presentation, there is now an opportunity for a question period. If you would each approach the microphones that are at the front of the two aisles, I'll call upon people in, as they stand. And if you have a question, please phrase it as a question. Otherwise, uh, let somebody else ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, there seems to me to be a, a, a real confusion or maybe an epistemological error in that people make a lot when they try to make a distinction between the government of a country and its people, such as in Iraq, we say, well, we're only fighting a war against the government, we're not against the nation or against the people, and so forth. I haven't quite been able to put my finger on it, but can you explain what that is? Yes, the error, people can hear the question, right? Yes. The error is taking something out of context. If I give you a sentence without any context, should you shoot an innocent man deliberately? I say, well, of course not. That's fantastic. You shoot the guilty man, not the innocent. But you are dropping the context. What if the innocent man is in a house filled with killers, and they are killing you, they're mowing you down? And you simply, there is no way to put on each bullet the name of the person that's going to hit. And the only way is to drop a bomb on the house and kill the innocent man. It's you or them because of their choice. There's no context anymore to say, well, he's innocent, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't hit him. That is utterly bizarre. It simply means memorizing a sentence, ignoring the circumstances. Could you comment on uh, your thoughts on the effectiveness of lecture as a way of instructing students before college or before the college level? Um, you mean in general in college or like, or like today? Um, in general. Actually, I'm, I'm, sp I'm thinking of before college. I teach at the high school level. It will lecture as opposed to what? As opposed to... Um, group work, which is the politically correct way of teaching now. Oh, no, absolutely not. I, believe, I see your point now. I believe the teacher should be an absolute cognitive authority in the classroom, that he's there, or should be there, because of his superior knowledge of the subject. Uh, he's the one to set the terms, to say what's essential and what isn't, what's the logical structure. And he should let the class participate only to the extent that he's trying to test their knowledge, find out if they understand, or emphasize something, or occasionally give them a breather. But certainly he should be the dominant presence. If they want to have a bull session, they do it on the playground, 
or in their own neighborhood. They don't come to school in order to express their feelings. <clears throat> Once we get rid of Hussein, or if we were to attack Iran, um, after we achieve that, what do we do with the nation and the majority of uh, passive, moderate Muslims who you say are as much a cause of terrorism against the U.S. as the act of terrorists? No, I wouldn't do anything <coughs> with anybody uh, because since they follow, the passive ones follow the latest trend, you merely get rid of the one trend that they're following and then they'll follow whatever else is there. So uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't make a point once the threat is over and the country is conquered. Uh, I certainly would not make a point of, quote, redeveloping it at the cost of billions and keeping soldiers occupying it for who knows how many decades in order to try to establish, quote, democracy among people who have never gone through the Enlightenment and who are still there for primitive, tribal, collectivists, super mystics, you are not going to establish freedom in those countries, no matter what contortions you go through. And therefore, it's a complete waste of time and the lives of the occupying army. And all that's going to happen if they do get a democracy is they'll vote themselves into Islamic fundamentalism five or ten years from now. So, <clears throat> my attitude is this. Annihilate the country. Get rid of... Uh, you know, every element of anti-Americanism and go home and let them do whatever they want because you have now given a message to them and to everybody else. This is what happens if you mess with us. What you do on your own home turf now, how you rebuild, what kind of regimes you have is not our business. But remember, one more terrorist incident and that country will go to. In other words, our strategy has to be not to induce love in that part of the world, but terror, fear. And the, the, one real war does that, and that's the end. <clears throat> and certainly not to go there and fight a war on the principle of not enraging the enemy. I mean, you couldn't put that in a 19th century farce by Sardou. No one would believe it. Thank you. Dr. Peacock, Jay Connie from Boston. In 1968, around January, you had a four-lecture course out on the ominous parallels, and that inspired me to some action later that year at the Democratic Convention. Right now, what I'm listening to, what I'm hearing makes me feel equally inspired. I'm wondering if at the schools, where you say there's such a great need, what I've seen in the uh, objectivist clubs is generally a low level of knowledge and support and ability to influence their community. Do you think ARI and the people that support this could fund an, an effort that sort of parallels what, what the religions do, but with good ideas to build well, institutions? Well, what would you specifically want the institute to do that it isn't doing now under your own book? <clears throat> if you could come up with an idea that he hasn't, I'd take my hat off to you. I'll talk to both of you about it. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, when he came on as executive director, they had some programs, and uh, I thought they were doing fine. And uh, what he has come up with in terms of programs is just beyond anything. I feel like a sub-kindergarten student compared to him with a PhD in terms of spreading objectivism. Uh, so uh, I'm speechless if you think there's still more that the Institute could do. I'm sure he'd like to hear it, if, uh, if he has time between his speeches and his TV appearance. I, I admire what they're doing, and it's certainly one man can't do it. It requires a lot of people and a lot of planning. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. You've said repeatedly that uh, the political fallout should be secondary, that we should be asserting our moral right in this war. And if I may make an inference uh, that say a thousand Iraqi civilians or soldiers should die if it meant that one U.S. Marine could live. So in that context, um, if we were to take your reasoning to the extreme level, why not just drop a nuclear bomb on Baghdad? I have no moral objections to the use of nuclear weapons at all. No moral objection. My objection or question is only this. 
I'm not a military specialist, so I cannot take it on myself to advocate any particular type of armament. I don't know what other consequences might flow from nuclear weapons. I don't know what other countries like Israel might be harmed inadvertently. I simply don't know. And I think you have to draw a line between philosophy and military strategy. That's why you have military commanders. What I think we should do is take the moral blinders and the self-crippling moral restrictions off of the military and say, we want you to devise the most efficient plan, safest to Americans, that will get rid of the enemy. It's not necessarily nuclear or even tactical nuclear weapons. Who knows what it is? They have now got weapons that I can't even spell. So uh, uh, I'm not afraid of the idea. A, a man is dead whether you kill him with an axe, a bow and arrow, or a nuclear weapon. It's life and death we're talking about. The means is not up to philosophers to prescribe. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, George Overcamp, Penn State uh, Objectivist Club, and also United States Marine Corps. Um, I attended the conference this weekend and also uh, the student conference today, and I've come to realize a lot more than I had in the past that we can't expect uh, objectivism to infiltrate the United States political system. Um, we can or can't? Can't. Can't, yeah. For many years to come, because it, it's simply not ready for that. Uh, what can we expect, I guess, in, in positive change um, that would be realistic? I mean... You in what time that, frame are you speaking? Well, I, I'm just thinking about the context that, um, you know, uh, the majority of Americans support President Bush right now, and the majority of the military does as well. But um, is it that we should be offering support for what he's doing while at the same time criticizing what he's not doing? Or how can we convey. No, I don't offer support for what he's doing. I've spoken out against the war and how it's being fought and why it was chosen. I support the soldiers in the field. I mean, what, what can any patriotic American do? Say he's against the soldier defending himself and killing an enemy in a war. Obviously, you support the soldiers, but you don't support the policy that put them there. Okay, but do you see in, I guess, the next 10 or 20 years, uh, a political movement that, that you would support? Any movement towards it at all? Well, movement towards it, yes, but uh, it depends what you call movement toward it. I started, I joined this crusade to change the world 52 years ago, in 1951. <clears throat> At that time, I uh, was reading Atlas Shrugged in manuscript before it was published. And I was very disappointed at one point, and I said to uh, Ayn Rand, I came too late. I was born too late. And she said, what do you mean? I said, the battle for the world is over. As soon as people read Adler Shrugged, we'll have total capitalism and there'll be nothing to fight for anymore. <laughs> she thought I was crazy and obviously <laughs> was right. <laughs> so I've, I've gone through periods where, you know, I had an incredibly over-optimistic view. I've now seen... <clears throat> 50 odd years where a lot of things have got very much worse than they were and a few things such as the size and activity of the objectivist movement have gotten better. Uh, some developments are hopeful such as the internet and more advanced worldwide communication. Uh, there, are, there are definite improvements on the whole I think culture as my talk is one example has gone down very badly <clears throat> because of education. Uh, it's impossible to predict. Uh, uh, you can see signs in the sense that when I went to college, I had a professor who would call me in periodically, this was in graduate school, at NYU, and he would call me in periodically. He knew that I was a friend of Ayn Rand's, and there was a few of us in her circle. And he said, how many of you are there now? And I'd say eight. And he would laugh. He thought that was the funniest thing he ever heard. Uh, you know, uh, here's this pitiful little handful. <clears throat> now, it's very much more than that around the world. I can't give figures, but it's thousands and thousands. And 
going into the colleges. Uh, her book sales are increasing, which is unheard of for an author that's dead uh, over 20 years and who is not a required text in colleges. And yet her sales are now approaching in paperback alone in the United States half a million a year. Uh, it's just unheard of. It's just a phenomenon in publishing that isn't believable. So there are a lot of encouraging signs. Um, but how long it would take for those signs to translate into even the beginnings of a political movement, I, I, I don't have enough expertise to even hazard a guess. I say it would certainly be 10 or 20 years, and, and I would guess. I don't expect to live to see it, but you very probably will. I, supposing civilization continues. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering about your context that you have spoken of, that we should take things in context in order to make decisions. Um, what about the context of the reasons why there are terrorist attacks? And even given that we used the atomic warfare on Japan, that only, you know, like there was an attack on September 11th, just 50 years later, the notion that we could go in and use some sort of overwhelming force on a nation or a people to actually take care of all enemies seems to be inaccurate considering... Well, we I didn't, I, I've already answered the question about nuclear weapons. So you, are you telling me what? That yeah. we shouldn't react strongly to 9-11 because we did to Japan? Well, no, I'm asking why you think that acting without restraint militarily will actually be better in the long run. Because I think that the whole Western civilization is fighting for its very survival. This is a clash of civilizations. This is not even one country against another or one political ideology against another. This is a fundamental anti-world, anti-reason, anti-this-life, anti-happiness philosophy uh, mi militantly trying to eradicate the West and saying openly that it prefers death to life. And that uh, is a threat that must be squelched. Now, militarily, we, it's not a threat at all if we would use our military. But if we don't use it, then it is a life and death threat. They have made it clear that they're going to annihilate the West and everything it stands for if we let them. And that is my reason. Where do we draw the line? Where well, do I don't draw the line anywhere that if it can be shown that it's us or them, then I say we survive and they die. All of Islam. That's it. I just let me add that I am not a Christian. I don't believe in loving your enemy, and I'm not an egalitarian. The fact that he's a human being and I'm a human being does not make us equal. Equal to whom? I, as an egoist, believe that my actions must be based on my welfare. My country must act according to its welfare. It doesn't take the position of a detached God saying, there's 12 more Iraqis than there are Californians, and therefore we should sacrifice California to Iraq. I think that is wicked. That's just a PS. <laughs> Hi, Don. Um, I was wondering if you think that it can be shown and made nationally public that Iran was responsible for the Koba Tower uh, bombings in 96, that would force the um, administration to look would at it. would not right? force them at all. That was on the front page of the New York Times. I had a radio show at the time, and I read the entire story on the very front page of the New York Times that they had implicated Iran in that Arabian bombing of American uh, soldiers, and that the Clinton administration was trying to hush it up because they were trying to improve their relations with Iran, and this would be a very awkward and embarrassing issue. So you wouldn't do a thing if you publicized that. You can't do anything by publicizing atrocities. Everybody knows where they come from. But, but the leadership is terrified of stating where they come from for moral, not for practical reasons. And well, therefore, it doesn't do any good to publicize atrocity. Even though, like, Bush is much, well, not much, less of an appeaser than Clinton was, nothing, you don't think it will make any difference? 
Uh, to weigh Bush and Clinton on the scale of appeasement would be very difficult. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I mean, Bush sends out more soldiers, and he has some stronger lines in his speeches, and I think he's more sincere than Clinton. It doesn't make any difference. I'm afraid um, we'll probably only have time for two questions more on each side. Now, you started late, you. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, we'll see how it goes. Go ahead. You mentioned in, um, in your uh, lecture that uh, uh, World War II was an example of how to fight a real war. And it seems that even after we fought the war the way it was supposed to be fought, um, we created restrictions on this country, such as the Geneva Conventions, such as which? the Geneva Conventions <laughs> and the United Nations, immediately following um, a war that we thought we fought the right way. Why do you think that happened, and what does that have to say, since it already happened almost 50 years ago, about where we are today? Well, I think you're right. If I implied that uh, people, the United States, Americans in the 40s, were great heroes that were philosophically unbreached, I retract that immediately. I say comparatively on the issue of self-defense, they were great heroes. But they were f obviously full of Christianity, full of the idea of one world, of peace, and all the rest of it. And the minute the mortal threat was removed, the people went back to their business, and the leadership, uh, uh, politically and intellectually, clamored for the United Nations and the Geneva Conventions and all the rest of it. So, the, I mean, the corruption began actually right after the Civil War, uh, the start of a guilt. In the, on American premises by American leaders. Uh, the big turning point was 1890 with the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was the first naked assault on capitalism. And there was the whole progressive movement and the New Deal movement, and there was all kinds of anti-American movements uh, uh, preaching uh, socialism, preaching fascism, and declaring American guilt. But it was, in the face of actual bombs, there was still enough American patriotism left. But as soon as that impetus was removed, it was back to anti-Americanism as usual on the part of our leadership, and then they went on from there. So you're right, the roots of today go back there, but the roots have grown into a big tree. <clears throat> Dr. Peacock, yeah. what set or sets of circumstances would justify an individual or individuals to take or initiate action against one's own country. I know Ayn Rand spoke of restriction of free speech as one of those reasons, and I was wondering if you would like to comment. What type of action against your country would you want to take? The initiation of physical force. Against whom, though? The citizens? No, the against, government? Against one's government. Only if you decided a revolution was necessary. And you would have to decide the way the American colonists did that you're under an unbearable tyranny, you're going to get a group of people, take up arms, declare your independence, and then go to war. Uh, and I would say, this is a ridiculous time to even consider this, as long as you can have a talk like today, without being interrupted and have me arrested by the police, there is still a chance for free speech and for persuasion. And therefore, it's it, 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 bizarre to talk about a revolution today. Where, where the if and when, if and when we had censorship, then I would say all bets are off, the country is over, take to the underground and do what you can. But thankfully, it's the liberals who are against censorship, not the conservatives. So it looks like it'll stay free for a while. Were the colonists wrong in the Boston Tea Party then? The pardon? Were the colonists wrong in the Boston no, Tea Party? No, because I think that was the prelude to a revolution. Thank you, Doc. Out of the numerous questions I could ask you, I just wanted to pose a couple of them. One, one because there's a lot of people, no time. Wh um, what do you, how do you think this war will affect the future generation, and how do you think history will be changed in the way it's taught in the different schools at the different levels? Neither and no way. I don't think it'll affect future generations, and I don't think it'll affect the teaching of history at all. It'll be a blip on the radar that'll be forgotten by everybody. Except Saddam Hussein if they catch him. 
Dr. Pikoff, good evening. I'm very happy to see you here tonight. Thank you. Um, I have a doubt, perhaps you may correct me. I have read somewhere that the U.S. knew, the, had broken the naval code and the military code of Japan prior to Pearl Harbor. Do you have any knowledge of these, or am I being misinformed? Uh, I, I don't want to rehash World War II. I'll just make to you a surprising statement, which is not relevant to my talk, and which I'm not going to argue about. But since you asked, I believe that Franklin Roosevelt incited the attack on Pearl Harbor, invited it. And there's documentary evidence that he knew in advance that it was coming, that he wanted this war so that we could get in and into it and then with, between him and Stalin divide up the world. But the public obviously didn't know that and they were responding to a real threat. And now don't ask me to prove that, but <laughs> read a book called The Roosevelt Myth by John Flynn and that'll give you some information. One question. Yeah, on I think e just one. Yeah. One question on each side and that's yeah. it. Thank you. Um, Robert Fischel from Cheshire Academy. Just asking, the voices that I'm hearing from the schools nowadays are, for, from the left, leftist movement in the schools, is no blood for oil and don't go to war for, you know, for oil and for economic interests. How would you respond to statements such as this? Number one, I would say, if you've got to go to war for something, oil is a damn good reason. <laughs> Oil is the lifeblood of an industrial civilization until and unless they find some future source of energy. So if we are actually starved for oil, which we wouldn't be short of energy if it wasn't for the ecologists, but if we are, then that becomes a matter of national survival. But secondly, I don't believe that was the purpose of this war. That's too selfish a purpose. And thirdly, I believe that it would be perfectly moral to do it without any terrorist atrocities because all of those oil wells were discovered, developed, and made possible by Western business and Western industry, and were then stolen from the West, nationalized, and expropriated. None of those countries have any moral entitlement to them, and if we went over to Saudi Arabia, our great ally, and said, okay, out, the oil is ours, that would be a 100% act of moral restitution, and on top of that, no one would ever do anything about it. So if... Uh, <laughs> uh, hello, Dr. Pugoff. My name is David Simon. I'm from Boston. I had a question um, about um, the role of altruism in, uh, and how it uh, may have resulted in the uh, uh, terrible population explosion in the last 50 years, and if you had any thoughts on Where that. is this population explosion? In the third world. Oh, in the third world. What has that got to do with altruism? Because uh, Albert Schweitzer and, and Livingston and all those people went trudging through the jungle bringing medicine to the third world before oh. they were culturally ready to do it. I don't think that uh, medicine to the third world is responsible for population explosion. I think large families are inherent in low cultures and that the birth rate goes down as the rate of civilization goes up and that it's a cultural phenomenon I don't see that has anything to do with altruism. <clears throat> On behalf of the Ford Hall Forum, I would ask you all to thank Dr. Peacock for being here today. Thank you very much.